know, Adolf Hitler had a good buddy down in Italy by the name of Benito Mussolini. Mussolini. And Benito Mussolini used to love all the time in his speeches, he used to love to good, declare tutto nello stato, nella contro lo stato. And in Italian that means everything for the state, nothing against the state. Now I think that's fascinating because every totalitarian movement in world history always despises the very essence of what we call our First Amendment. Many of you know the First Amendment. You have it memorized. And I, I, I tell my students at the academy and at the college, if there's one thing you're going to remember besides the Judeo-Christian foundation of this nation is the beautiful First Amendment, which as you know is freedom of religion, speech, press, and assembly, and the right to petition your government when your government is violating our God-given rights. So I don't think it's a coincidence that totalitarians, that a Mussolini or a Hitler or a Stalin or a Che Guevara or a Fidel Castro, what's the first thing that goes? Religion, the Judeo-Christian worldview, and the education related to the Judeo-Christian worldview. They despise that worldview. They despise the declaration, uh, the idea that uh, God created the heavens and the earth, the idea that we are made in the Imago Dei, the image of God. They despise that. So when Adolf Hitler comes along and says, the Jews be damned because the Jews claim to have given the world the Ten Commandments. And think of what Hitler personified, raping and murdering and pillaging and all the antithesis of what the Ten Commandments or the, the Torah, the law uh, was, that was given to us, what they represented. And so Hitler, in essence, was making an attempt by killing the Jews to destroy the Judeo-Christian worldview. It's not a coincidence that people like Karl Marx and others despise the reality of the transcendent beauty that there is a God in heaven who loves us and His values are to be conveyed to us from His heavenly throne uh, as understood in the Our Father. These are things that I don't think people really grasp and understand in many cases in our postmodern world that has destroyed a belief in absolute truth. Truth is on trial, so to speak. The Declaration of Independence starts out, we hold these truths to be self-evident. When Thomas Jefferson penned those words, he didn't just create those words out of thin air. Those were words that went way back into the, the roots, the heritage of Western civilization, whose foundation was the Hebrew prophets, were the Hebrew apostles of the New Testament. Western civilization's values come from the Judeo-Christian worldview. So when Thomas Jefferson wrote those wonderful words, we hold these truths, in essence, think of it, he was proclaiming to the world something that is so precious and eternal that we are made in the image of God and that we do have eternal value and therefore it is worth dying and fighting for. This is why our founders were so inspired in that time period, in the 1776 time period in our history. They understood something that we're losing in our culture. So when Mussolini came along and he makes his declaration, his arrogant declaration that the state is everything and nothing against the state, that goes back thousands of years. It goes all the way back, in fact, to the Tower of Babel. When man made an attempt to create a state that would be deified and God would be denied. All throughout history, you see tyrants and despots attempting to do that, to deny God and proclaim themselves to be deity on the earth. When I've taken my students to the Colosseum in Rome, and, you, you, and I talk about how it was Rome, uh, excuse me, Jewish slaves uh, uh, that were taken from Israel and put to work to build the Colosseum, and you bring, you bring them by the Ark of Titus, and on the top of the Ark of Titus, it talks about how the emperor of Rome is deity, is God Almighty. Man on the earth denying Yahweh, denying Jesus, but proclaiming himself to be God on the earth. This is not new. The Hitlers and the Stalins and the Castros, these despots who deify themselves and deny the deity of Jesus, the, the, the wonder of the Word of God. Now when you go back into the annals of history, you see that a lot of these Judeo-Christian ideas, uh, you see when uh, the Apostle Peter, the Apostle Paul uh, are evangelizing, giving the good news, predicated upon a book, the Old Testament. It's now the manifesta manifestation of a new covenant, a new book, the New Testament. And that these are words, these are, these are words that are to be understood in Hebrew and in Greek. Uh, 
and to be translated into various cultures. That's a form of education that influenced Alfred the Great of England about a thousand years ago who codified the Torah, the New Testament, and codified it into English common law. And you know, we could go on and on and on. All the different influences in the uh, European Western civilization worldview where the Bible, the Torah, the scriptures, that worldview was part and parcel of education of the day. And our, the university was created by Christians. Think of it. The, the university is where a student would study the universe. But its number one book were the scriptures. They presuppose something, that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So therefore, the very source of this amazing education system, the university, is where students in a Christian context, knowing Hebrew so they could understand the Old Testament, knowing Greek so they could understand the New Testament, knowing Latin, the language of education uh, discourse in those days. The University of Oxford and Cambridge and Padua and Sorbonne and all the great universities all had a Judeo-Christian foundation. Even the early scientists, they were all Christians, working from a Christian paradigm, a Christian presupposition. These things are being denied in our educational systems today. These things are being lied about. We need more historical correctness and historical context to enlighten our students in this, in this worldview, in this area. And so those kinds of things were going on in the university, They're not only with the grappling with the origin of the universe, I mean, they understood that, but they wanted to, to see the beauty of God's universe, thus the word university, where you go to study the universe and the creator of the universe. It's not a coincidence that theology was called the queen of science. Think of it, theology was called the queen of science. Now people despise theology in so many ways. It's so politically incorrect to even bring up anything related to the, those topics. And it's the very essence of what laid the foundation for Western civilization. So, for example, we know uh, many of you have seen the movie Braveheart, right? And I started my book, Mother Should I Trust the Government? I deal with what I call thatch roof cottages. It's a term I created uh, as I'm watching the movie Braveheart, and I've probably seen it 40 times in my lifetime. I'm such a geek with the movie. I've taken my students to Edinburgh. I've taken them to the Battle of Stirling. You know, I, I, I use the phrase freedom at football games, driving the kids nuts. Freedom! It's all about freedom and liberty, and, and I, I emphasize the Scottish roots uh, of American republicanism, small r, the philosophy of republicanism, which is limited government and the respect of life and liberty across this land. So it's not a coincidence that the flag of Scotland, this is the flag of Scotland, you know Braveheart is, is based primarily in Scotland and England too, but the flag of Scotland is the Andrew Cross. Andrew was Peter's brother. Andrew was murdered by the governor of, of Greece because he refused to shut up. You talked about proclaiming the word, right? He refused to be silenced in proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Andrew says, I must not stop speaking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he was crucified in an X form, thus the symbol of Scotland, the symbol of Russia. Now think of it, that flag may not seem to be a very potent or powerful symbol, but Scottish Political philosophers influence our founders as much as any English political philosophers. The concept by Samuel Rutherford of lex rex, a Latin term that means law over the king. Kings in throughout ages, most kings have been corrupt and despotic and totalitarian, denying life and liberty. That the, their, their, their citizens or their, their, their uh, individuals within their domain were to be used for them, to be serfs or slaves unto them. A king, according to the Torah, was to be a servant unto the people. It's not a coincidence the leader of England is called a prime minister. The word minister comes from the Greek word to be a servant unto the people. And so within the traditions of Scotland and England was this profound influence of <clears throat> the servanthood of leaders unto the people. This has been so much denied uh, in, in so much of our history and so much of our political discourse that politicians, that our leaders, are to be servants unto the people. 
And so you see these kinds of ideas, this lex rex, where law is over the king, not king over the law, developing in the 11th and the 12th and the 13th century. Other great uh, English and Scottish and in some cases French and German philosophers grappling and discussing, debating these issues of life and liberty and the relationship of government to that. But the bottom line is you could see that as these things unfolded in Western civilization, in European history, by the way, Europe is, um, has much of our roots. They don't come from India. They don't come from China. I believe in studying multicultures. But if my students are going to understand the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution, I'm taking them to Scotland. I'm taking them to England. I'm taking them into the worldview, the mindset of the thinkers that influence the George Washington, the Alexander Hamiltons, the Patrick Henrys, the Samuel Adams, etc., etc. These are important things to understand. So these symbols are used by me all over, all over my classroom, and you see it's a Christian symbol. So it's not a coincidence when you look at the symbol of the United Kingdom, it's the Andrew Cross is the bottom part of it. It's the St. George Cross and the St. Patrick Cross. It's three crosses. The Judeo-Christian worldview expressed in the flag of England. Where was George Washington's father and grandfather from? Where were Sam Adams and John Adams' relatives from? From England or Scotland. The Scottish-English political philosopher's worldview influencing us. And by the way, it's not a coincidence that militant radical Islam despises these symbols and burns these symbols all the time. The symbol of the United Kingdom, the symbol of the, uh, the flag of the United States, and of course the flag of Israel, the Judeo-Christian worldview. So in the book, I discuss this idea of William Wallace simply wanting to live in his thatch roof castle, just to be left alone from a corrupt government, from a corrupt king. And he's willing to give his life, and in the end, he cries out freedom. Well, that really is very symbolic of that Scottish heritage that really shaped the worldview of our founders, many of our founders back in the day. So now let's fast forward. It's once again a, a corrupt English king. In, in the movie Braveheart, it was uh, King Edward I, King Edward I Longshanks, about 800 years ago. Now it's in the 1750s, 1760s. You have a French and Indian War, and because, as you know, wars cause all kinds of debt. Debt creates taxation. Taxation creates frustration for the colonists, and the colonists are frustrated because the king of England, unconstitutionally, is doing what to the colonies? without parliamentary representation, without due process, is taxing and invading the privacy of the citizens. And long story short, people like Sam Adams and others and Patrick Henry and George Mason, they begin to say enough is enough. They were willing to stand up and fight against this tyranny. In fact, as you know, they created an organization that was known as the Sons of Liberty. Sons and daughters of liberty gathering together, putting their lives in a line, being willing to, to, to speak out against the tyranny, the oppression of a big central government that was denying their God-given rights. People like James Otis, a very dear friend of, of John Adams, a lawyer from Boston, who famously said, a man's home is his castle. A man's home is his castle, his thatch roof castle where no government has a right to violate our private property, to violate the fruits of our labor by confiscating our labor and giving it to those who, are do, who are, demand that they're entitled to that which we've earned. These are things that go way back in our history. And I mentioned James Otis in the book, and I mentioned uh, people like Sam Adams and their willingness to give of their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor for liberty. They did speak out. So much so that, that they were willing to die, and many of them did die for that. And, by the way, the pulpits, the pulpits in 1776 were on fire for Jesus Christ. Were on fire for the declaration and the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the responsibility of citizens to speak out and to act out to defend one's life and liberty. These things are rarely, if ever, taught in our schools anymore. Liberty has been flipped. You know, in 1776, liberty, I tell my students, it was simply defined as liberty was freedom from government. Freedom from government. Now the idea of liberty is what will the government give me? 
What will the government take from somebody else to give to me so, because I'm entitled to it? it it's, it's the, these professors, they, they use all these fancy words, negative liberty, positive liberty. Well, think of it. If throughout the ages, you know, uh, totalitarian despots were saying that I am above the law and you shall serve me and your property is my property and your wife is my wife and your things are my things. In fact, you are mine and I will do with you what I want. And along comes individuals saying, no, political philosophers and then individuals willing to die and fight for us from the glorious revolution all the way up to the American Revolution. These are, these are amazing historical events embedded in the Declaration of Independence, which was bold enough to say that all of us were equal and that our Creator was called in the Declaration of Independence and Freedom from Religion Foundation. I know you're not going to like this in ACLU. I know you're going to despise this, but our Creator is called Supreme Judge of the World. Think of that, supreme judge of the world, when we live in a day and age of, of all the licentiousness and denial of the truth, this battle of worldview truths that David uh, so wonderfully talked about. So the Declaration is something that, in fact, as you, many of you know from your understanding of history, the progressives despise it because it has a standard of truth that is eternal and that reaches up into the heavens. It's transcendent. It transcends the, 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 uh, the, 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 uh, the fallenness of man. It transcends the, the inability for us to be able to be gods on our own. We can't be. It's only through Christ can we be empowered to overcome the oppression on the earth, to be emboldened and, and to be freed to live life fully. And our, our, our founding fathers, most of them, most of them understood that. And they were influenced by a resounding pulpit. Remember, it was uh, Alexis de Tocqueville. His, his book, as many of you know, Democracy in America. Horrible title. The original title was changed a few years after his first edition came out, The American Republic. But when he came from, to visit, he, he wanted to know what, what made this country tick. And so he went from New York City all the way to Green Bay, Wisconsin. And he went through the highways and the byways and to the churches and the valleys and all over uh, down the St. Lawrence Seaway and visited Wisconsin and Ohio and all over the, the, you know, the, that part of the, the country. And his conclusion was, it was the pulpit. He said it was the pulpit that was resounding with boldness. And he says, in America, you cannot, Americans cannot conceive of liberty without Christianity. Liberty without Christianity. And in this day and age, this licentious, perverted, distorted definition of liberty, what can the government give me? Remember, like George Washington declared, you know, government is like a fire. It is a power. It can be used wonderfully if it is checked. But it can be used horribly if it's allowed to do its own thing. And as we know throughout history, government usually does its own thing. It's like a cancer. It grows and grows and spreads and spreads and kills and kills and destroys and destroys. So these are the things that uh, I discuss in the book. And, and I actually, um, how many have seen the series John Adams, the HBO series John Adams? Now for those of you in here, when I pick on John Adams, don't get angry with me, all right? I love John Adams. I call him a pistol patriot. I mean, you cannot watch this film and see him in that, and, and just get a sense of, and you read books on him, and you're like, oh my God, this guy was amazing. And of course, as you know, there was tension between John and Sam. They had differences, viewpoints on how things should be done back in the day. A couple of things that come to mind that I talk about in the book is the Boston Massacre, right? The thing that I admire about John Adams is, you know, my first book was called Mobocracy. Uh, and it's, it's a term that the founders used about the mob, the mob mentality, the lack of the rule of law. The mob, of course, this was in Madison that denied the election of 2010, and the mob went crazy demanding uh, certain entitlements and demanding certain things and ignoring the will of the people of the state of Wisconsin. But the people of the state of Wisconsin spoke loud and clear three times. And they still don't get it. But the point is, <laughs> but back in... seven. Um, it, with John Adams and the Boston Massacre of 1770. Sam and others, they wanted, the mob came and they wanted to take those British soldiers and kill them immediately. 
without what? Without a trial, without due process. And John said, this nation, our state at the time, Massachusetts, will not conduct itself this way. These men are innocent until proven guilty. We need to believe in the rule of law and due process. They will get their day in court. They got their day in court, and John Adams got them off because he had enough evidence to prove their situation, their innocence. Right. Now, that's an that's amazing thing. I, I know it upsets a lot of you know, Sons of Liberty types. It's like, whoa, wait a minute. That was the John Adams, if you see this in the film. Now, John Adams comes along, and he's not the pen of the Declaration. He's the voice. And he, he takes that Judeo-Christian worldview. He takes that congregational influence within his thinking, and he's, and he's proclaiming liberty throughout the land in, in, in the movie. And, he's, of course, he's attacking King George III. Now, in 17, the John Adams of 1776 is very interesting. He hates big government, despotic government, a government that's unconstitutional and violating our God-given rights. And then what happens in 1796 when he is the President of the United States, right? How soon he forgot where he came from. My mother used to always tell me that. Never forget where you came from, right? How soon. And it, 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 it can happen to any one of us. If we became a congressman, a senator, or a president, or had some position of power where we, 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 we spoke a certain way about limited government, and then we have the power. What will the power do to us? Will it corrupt us? Absolutely. Well, there is John Adams, and of course, as you know, in the book I discussed the Federalists, the development of the Federalist Party, along with the Republicans, otherwise known as the Anti-Federalists, anti and I discussed the different viewpoints. I love the, the different schools. You know, you have the... You know, I, I re always recommend you read the Anti-Federalist Papers along with the Federalist Papers. There's good in both of them. We learn from both of them, all right? So there's, a, there's beginning this development of different political parties and philosophies and things going on, and here is John, President John Adams, and his vice president is, is uh, Thomas Jefferson. So here's the Federalist president with the Republican vice president. They're not getting along because John, excuse me, Tom is saying to John, John, have you forgotten your 1776 mindset? You're becoming a big government guy. And then they created the Alien Sedition Acts. Without getting too, in too many details, the bottom line is one part of the Sedition Act says, if you speak badly against the president of the United States, we'll throw you in jail. So Republican newspaper publishers were put in jail for speaking out against the President of the United States. One guy I mentioned in a book by the name of David Brown, he was an old Sons of Liberty guy, and back in those days they'd make banners, and they'd hang them up on a pole. And one of his banners, I'll paraphrase it, said something to the effect of, down with the Stamp Act, down with the Alien Sedition Act, down with the President of the United States, up with the Vice President. Well, John Adams' people had him put in jail for a year and a half and fined about $500, which back then was a lot of money. And the federal government went around arresting dozens and dozens and dozens of Republican newspaper editors for daring to attack the president and the president's administration. He forgot! This is my point. If you study the founders, you know, you know Jefferson called them uh, uh, demigods, right? They have, they're fragile, sinful human beings just like we are. And, 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 and power became a drug to them, to many of them too. And they had to struggle and grapple with how much government do we have and how much government do we, do we actually um, render. Enough government to protect our God-given rights, but not too much government to harm, to hurt, to destroy life, liberty, and property. So even the pistol patriot John Adams violated his own principles of 1776. Let that be a warning to any one of us that once we've been given the power, how we can uh, manipulate it and use it poorly. Um, but with that being said, I still do admire John Adams, and we have a lot to learn from John Adams. Now you go to the miracle at Philadelphia, 1787. As many of you know from your history uh, uh, class, uh, um, classrooms, you know that um, the Articles of Confederation, look, the founders did not want a big central government. So they created a loosey-goosey Articles of Confederation that were in many ways highly ineffectual. Even many uh, uh, um, Confederates, 
back then were admitting we need to have more uh, smoothness when it comes to commerce, uh, uh, monetary problems with, between the states, uh, you know, Maryland and uh, Delaware, no, excuse me, Maryland and uh, Virginia fighting over the Potomac River, uh, geographical problems going on. We need to find a way of being able to work with our 13 states, our 13 colonies. So they got together and they had the, the, the convention in 1787, summer of 1787. And many of you know what Patrick Henry said and why he didn't go. Does anybody know what Patrick Henry said? I got a feeling, Alan, you know. I smell a rat. Smell a rat. <laughs> so the anti-federalist, I, I, I prefer to call him Republican, not political party, but a political philosophy. And I mentioned in the book, you know, like David, I know that feeling where you got so much in here. And you, you, but I, I mentioned in the book though, the idea that, look, this idea of republicanism, I, you know, I say that and people go, that's not the Republican Party. I know, I know, it's a political philosophy. It's a, a philosophy that goes back to Scotland. It was when the Whigs or the Republicans fought against the king and they bring those ideas through history and they bring them over to America and the colonies. So the Republican philosophy was the idea of a limited government, of a small government, of a decentralized government. Patrick Henry, George Mason, of those Republicans, or even a Thomas Jefferson would have said, I'm a Republican. Okay? So it wasn't a negative term, it was a very positive, affirming term. And so he says, I smell a rat because I have a feeling that there's going to be too many people who want a highly centralized government that's going to violate not only the people's sovereignty, but the sovereignty of the individual states. So, as you know, there were a lot of compromises that went on to the Constitutional Convention, which I'll be talking about in the, the Freedom Project week when we have here in, in June, a couple of weeks, right? Uh, as you, as you know, bottom line is they do pass the Constitution, they ratify it, which by the way is fascinating to study the ratification. The debates which in, within every state. Now I'm one of those geeks that reads that stuff. It's fascinating because what it does, it opens up that world of grappling over how much government should we have. Enough to protect, but not too much to hurt. And both schools have some very good ideas. You need a big enough government. Let me give you a quick example, James Madison. He's all over the place, kind of like me in the book at some spots. You, you can't figure me out because you're going, what is this guy? I mean, he's, at one point he's for bigger government in the authentic protect the people sense, but in most other points he's for smaller government. Well, James Madison was one of those too. As a Federalist, he actually was a Federalist who became a Republican. He wanted a big enough government to protect the people, but he saw the, the tendency of the central government is to harm the people. So he, he's all over the place, and he joins with Jefferson to write against John Adams. And eventually he becomes president. The Federalist Party ends up you know, dwindling and falling apart. But here's the point. When he becomes president and the British go to war with us in 1812, he goes, oops, our government wasn't big enough to fight against the British. Do you follow what I'm saying? I can't do justice to these things where there is time when some of these individuals, our wise founders, said we do need to have enough government to protect, but not too much to hurt. And so these voices are good. They're, it's like iron sharpening iron where they help us understand this world of the founding of the country. Uh, and, I, and I deal with that through, through most of the book. One of the most controversial chapters is by a chapter on slavery and death by federal and state governments. But uh, I think because of time, I'll pass that one over. Uh, and then at the end, I deal with, in chapter 6, 1913 to today, progressivism versus our federal republic. It's interesting, you mentioned the year 1912. Many historians believe that time period in our history is, is one, of the, one of the most egregious uh, explosions of the denial of uh, not only our Judeo-Christian worldview, but of our limited government, uh, the nature of our limited government, which for the most part from 1789 till 1912, 1913 was reasonably limited. But the progressives, as you know, hated the Declaration of Independence. They hated the Constitution because they felt it restricted. It restricted the government. It was so, it's supposed to restrict the government. But the progressive says, no, it's a re those are regressive documents. I mean, the Declaration has this idea that our rights come from God. Progr many of the progressives had this idea that rights came from where? From the state, from the government. And the progressives with their arrogance, the Woodrow Wilson PhD types. I have a PhD, therefore I know what's best for all the citizens of this nation, right? 
And so therefore these progressives says, look, we can create administrators and bureaucrats, not just 10, 20, but tens of thousands of them who will love you so much and be so concerned about your well-being in Washington, D.C., you will fall in love with the central government. And you could see 100 years ago, a little over 100 years ago, the federal income tax, the Federal Reserve, right? You see the development of these federal, highly centralized control entities that now come into our lives. They come into our pocketbooks. They come into our homes. If the, I would argue if the founders were, I think I broke my DVD, if the founders were alive today, they would be freaking out to think that the Internal Revenue Service comes into our homes and knows the minutia of the fruits of our labor. And then they dicker with a marginal tax rate where Woodrow Wilson promises at a 7% level and says it's only going to be for a few of those bad rich people on the top and I promise you'll never go beyond that. And then boom, there's World War I and now it's up to 77% and now it starts to go into lower uh, brackets. And then uh, Silent Cal, Calvin Coolidge comes along and says, whoa, We've got a counterproductive tax rate. Let's bring it down to 25. And you see this seesawing up and down of the, of the marginal tax rate, the so-called, well, it is the progressive tax rate, which is borrowed from Communist Manifesto, the progressive tax rate of Karl Marx. And they play games, and so if they lower it, we feel like, oh, they really love us because they lowered it for us when the fact of the matter is it still invades into the lives of the American citizens in ways that our founders never would have imagined. And so it's interesting to note that around that time period is the development of the Scopes Monkey Trial, when all of a sudden, uh, you know, the ACLU gets developed around the late 1819, 1920 time period, and you got Helen Keller, and you have Roger Baldwin, and these are progressives, these are secular progressives who despise the Judeo-Christian worldview, they despise uh, the idea that our rights come from our Creator, and they begin to say, how can we, in essence, destroy that foundation? And it's through education, in the classrooms, in the churches. It's it's Antonio Gramsci, who, by the way, Mussolini ended up putting in prison, and he died in prison in, like, was it 1937? It was just one crazy socialist fascist hating another crazy socialist fascist, you know what I mean? And so he ended up dying in the prison, but it was Gramsci who said, we'll, it's called the long march through the institutions, which maybe you cover in your book, I don't know. But Gramsci said, look, the Americans, you know, the, the Judeo-Christian worldview from England and from America, you're not going to get them with the sword. You're going to get them in the culture. You know, you hear this idea of social justice. So it's, it's the culture. It's the culture. It's the culture. The culture is either for Christ or the culture is against Christ. It's the culture. And Gramsci and other individuals like him, the Frankfurt School and all the various schools and Herbert Marcuse and these atheist, secularist, Marxist types, when they started teaching in Madison and Columbia and Berkeley and all around this country, and they had a whole new school of thinkers and teachers in the 1960s. And they've been teaching my generation. And then many within my generation are just perpetuating the things Dave brings up in his book and I bring up in the book Mobocracy and discuss in that chapter on progressives. So I know time is coming to an end, so I'm going to close with this. I think it's interesting that Dave brought up the idea of Jesus, Jesus, Jesus magnified, the prophecies of Jesus. Well, when Jesus came into the synagogue and he un uh, and he rolled out, or the attendant gave him the, the scroll from the prophet Ishayahu, the prophet Isaiah. And Jesus says, I have come to proclaim freedom to the captives. There was also what's called a rabbinic reference. There was, a lot of times they'll make references to more than one scripture. He was not only talking about the, uh, uh, the prophet Isaiah. And, and, and we wouldn't understand that, but if you're in a synagogue and you're raised in Judaism, you would know what the Rabbi Yeshua, Rabbi Jesus is doing. And as he puts on the talit and he starts reading from Isaiah, and he says, I have come to set the captives free. He's also making a reference to the book of Leviticus, chapter 25.10. And the book of Leviticus, chapter 25.10, is etched on our liberty bell, and it says... Proclaim liberty throughout the land and unto all the inhabitants thereof. That's what you were saying, David. We need to speak out. 
We need to write out, speak out, talk out, teach out, and proclaim liberty throughout the land and unto all the inhabitants thereof. Let's live. Let's, let's get that liberty bell etched in our hearts and our minds and on our voices uh, in our neighborhoods and around this land. Thank you guys very much. <laughs>